Good morning, and thank you for joining us in today's session of Business World Insights. My name is Patricia Mirosol. I am Business World's multimedia reporter, and I will be your host and moderator for today. It's been almost a year now since the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus disease as a pandemic. In fact, a few days from now, the Philippines will be on its first year anniversary of the countrywide quarantine. Without a doubt, this pandemic disrupted healthcare institutions down to their breaking points. But alongside this pandemic, and for decades now, the healthcare community and the general public has to have been fighting another battle, cancer. Cancer is the third leading cause of mortality in the Philippines, and it continues to be a national health priority. Globally, one in six deaths are caused by cancer. The most common causes of cancer death, according to the World Health Organization, are cancers of the lung, colorectum, stomach, liver, and breast. Today, together with Parkway Cancer Center and Mount Elizabeth Hospital, Singapore, Business World Insights invited three cancer specialists from Singapore to discuss the latest breakthroughs and innovations and treatments on digestive cancers. The topic for today's discussion is hope, science, and technology, cancer care in the new normal. We hope to finish this discussion with you, our audience, learning how to prevent, cure, and win the cancer fight. Please take note that we will also be addressing select questions from the audience later for our Q&A. So do ready your questions. Without further ado, let's welcome on screen our three speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Fu Qian Fong. Dr. Fu Qian Fong specializes in cancers that affect the gastrointestinal tract, such as the esophagus, stomach, pancreas, small and large intestines, neuroendocrine, biliary tract, and anal canal. He is a member of the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, the European Society of Medical Oncologists, and the Hong Kong Society College of Physicians. The second speaker is Dr. Chua Zhu Shan. Dr. Chua Zhu Shan is a gastroenterologist with a subspecialty expertise in the field of interventional endoscopy. This includes therapeutic endoscopy and endoscopic ultrasonography. He has a strong interest in diseases relating to the hepatopancreatical biliary system, as well as gastrointestinal cancers. Acknowledged as an accomplished endoscopist, he is a member of the Quality Assurance Subcommittee of the National Colorectal Cancer Screening Program of Singapore. He is currently the president of the Gastroenterological Society of Singapore. Our third speaker is Dr. Liao Quin Hin. Doc with more than 18 years of clinical experience, Dr. Liao Quin Hin's expertise and specializations include hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgery, laparoscopic surgery and endoscopy, surgical oncology, neuroendocrine oncology, surgical infection, and acute surgical care. With his extensive experience and skills, he is recognized internationally as a key opinion leader and key thought leader by many medical professional bodies and healthcare industries in the fields of hepatobiliary surgery, surgical infections, and neuroendocrine oncology. Good morning, doctors, and welcome to today's discussion. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. To start off this discussion, I'd like to address this first question to Dr. Fu Kian Fong. Dr. Fu, can you run with us briefly what digestive cancer is? What are its most common types and to whom do these cancers most commonly occur? Okay, let me share my screen first. Okay, yes. so to answer your question, uh, I'll just draw a little picture the digestive tract starts from the mouth. It goes all the way from the mouth to the gullet, to the stomach, 
and then it goes to the small intestine, the large intestine, and then all the way down to the anus. And related to the digestive tract is the liver, the gallbladder, the bowel ducts, and this organ called the pancreas. All right, so this is uh, the whole digestive tract. Uh, I went through the, the data from the Philippines and we the top 10 cancers, among the top 10 cancers among uh, in Philippines, uh, colorectal as well as liver cancers are the among the top five cancers in Philippines. All right, so this is the thing. What are the risk factors for colon cancer? Mainly some factors that we cannot change like age, some genetic factors, family history, and certain underlying conditions. And other lifestyle factors that related to colon cancer are things like alcohol, being obese, a diet that's high in fat, smoking, physical inactivity, and lack of sleep. As for liver cancer, uh, the risk factors for liver cancer are hepatitis B, hepatitis C, liver cirrhosis or hardening of the liver from any cause like drinking excessive alcohol, fatty liver, which is getting more and more com uh, common, and hereditary uh, hemochromatosis. Environmental toxins like uh, this uh, chemical called aflatoxin found in uh, moldy peanuts and corn, or some contaminated drain water uh, containing this blue-green algae toxin. People, male smokers, diabetic, and those who take a lot of red meat has a higher risk for liver cancer. As for other uh, digestive cancers, most common uh, risk factors will include smoking, drinking alcohol, drinking very hot drinks like uh, in esophagus cancer, infections with like a helicobacter or certain viruses, taking sorted and processed foods, uh, being overweight and other genetic causes. Thank you for that, Dr. Wu. That's right. For Dr. Chua Zhushan, what are the most common symptoms of digestive cancers? Okay, so digestive cancers can have a wide range of symptoms depending on uh, how advanced the disease is. So at the very beginning, there can be no symptoms at all, but you might just get a bit of gastric discomfort for stomach thing, uh, pain or a change in your bowel habit. So if you used to go uh, once a day and you now go three times a day uh, for the last two weeks, then maybe you should have a checkup and so on. Now, obviously, as the, as the disease or cancer advances, pain becomes a problem. Uh, for liver cancers and pancreas cancer, jaundice is a problem where, where obstruction of the bowel duct leads to yellowing of the skin and the eyes. Um, a loss of weight and loss of appetite uh, for no apparent reason. So you didn't go and diet and you didn't go for an exercise regime, but you miraculously have lost a few kilos. Um, I, I think it's important to make sure that there is no other process that is actually helping you to lose your weight. Um, you want to look out in terms of passing motion, you want to look out for blood, uh, and, and, and as I said, a change in your power habit, be it from constipation or diarrhea. Um, swallowing with pain is another symptom that, uh, that needs to be evaluated for esophageal uh, a cancer, also in terms of vomiting or unable to keep food down. So, so these in general are, are the symptoms that people with digestive cancers can experience. Okay. And how has the diagnosis of digestive cancers advanced in this past decade, decade Dr. Chua? Is it easier and more accurate to diagnose digestive cancers now than in the past? Well, it certainly has become uh, much more accurate. Uh, it's not necessarily easier, but a lot more accurate and we are, are more certain of our diagnosis. Um, in terms of uh, diagnosing uh, digestive cancers in the digestive tract, esophagus, uh, colon, and stomach, we would have to do endoscopy. And the endoscopes nowadays are extremely advanced the resolution is very, very good as you would expect. Um, we have 4K scopes, we have um, multiple uh, 
filters put in to increase the contrast where we can then see cells uh, clearer, abnormal cells clearer. We also have zoom scopes which can magnify this, the, the tissue to a very, very high magnification and make us suspect that something is abnormal. Uh, apart from that, we have uh, new techniques which can uh, go beyond the, the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. For example, what we call endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, it's a scope with an ultrasound at the end of the scope, and it allows us to do an ultrasound of the organs that are related to the, the digestive tract. So we can see the pancreas very well, we can see the gallbladder, we can see the bowel duct, um, and this allows us to um, evaluate the pancreas, uh, especially if we can see a mass, we can take a biopsy and confirm that this is indeed either a pancreatic cancer or not. Um, so, so there are a lot of new advances uh, in endoscopy alone just to obtain the tissue for diagnosis as well as to be able to diagnose things earlier. All right. And uh, Dr. Fu mentioned earlier that um, lifestyle it's lifestyle related, these digestive cancers. Can you mention some types of food that people should maybe restrict or avoid eating to prevent these types of cancers? Well, let me bring you back to what kind of foods here you, you, that, that increase your risk of uh, cancer. Basically, the kind of foods that increase your risk of cancer are, are red meat, uh, fatty foods. And so red meat uh, is known to be a probable carcinogen um, by the IARC, and, and then there is processed red meat. So you're talking about uh, bacon and salami. These are, are processed red meat, and they have a definite carcinogenic role. So you really want to avoid or uh, at least limit your intake of red meat. Uh, cruciferous vegetables uh, have been shown to reduce your risk of esophageal cancers as well as colon cancer. And, and so taking lots of vegetables, keeping yourself healthy. Um, obesity is a big thing. Um, so, uh, and, and exercise is a good thing. So exercise has been shown that if you uh, walk or, or you cycle about an hour, it can reduce your risk of colon cancer by about 10 to 15%. So, so, um, so all the healthy things we tell people to do, you know, don't, don't get overweight, don't smoke, don't drink. Uh, exercise and don't eat too much red meat and have uh, lots of vegetables in your diet. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chua. Moving forward to a more specific type of cancer, I'd like to address this next question to Dr. Liao Quing Him. Dr. Liao, can you please expound more on pancreatic cancers as well as GEP and ATs for gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? How common are they, and how do you detect these? Thank you, Chai. Um, as we know, pancreas is not just one single organ. The pancreas, in actual fact, have two organs with two different functions. So one of the functions is involved in digestion. The other function is uh, the organ produces a hormone that this hormone helps to regulate the body uh, metabolism or the level of sugar and other uh, related uh, function. Now, if you look at the diagram behind me, you can see that uh, the organ have two different types of cells. One type of cell, as I said before, is to produce um, digestive juice to help in our digestion of food. Mm -hmm. The other type of cells is called neuroendocrine cells. Uh, these cells belongs to uh, a group of cells that produce hormone and this hormone help to regulate the body function. So majority of the cancer that we see, about 90% of cancer that we see come from the mother cells that produce digestive juice uh, uh, or the organ that is responsible, uh, responsible for digestion. And this is called adenocarcinoma. 
The other type of cancer, what we call the neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas, is a tumor whose mother cells come from the neuroendocrine cells uh, that produce a hormone. Um, the frequency is not so frequency. The frequency of occurrence is about in every 100,000 uh, population, we see roughly about three to five patients. And uh, this group of patients is completely different from the patient with adeno can adenocarcinoma cancers because um, as you can understand the cancer cell come from a different mother cells so in terms of its uh, aggressiveness in terms of its uh, behavior uh, of invading the body is completely different okay thank you for that dr liao my next question is for dr fu again can you please share some of the latest advancements in terms of how we now understand digestive cancers as well as their management and treatment? Let me share my screen again. Okay. Oops, it's gone again. All right. Uh, I'll start by sh sharing a patient story. Uh, this is Mr. X. Uh, he presented six coming to seven years ago with change in bowel habit and bloating. He had intestinal obstruction due to a cancer in the descending colon and he was operated and the histology showed a very rare but aggressive small cell neuroendocrine cancer of the colon. He had a PET scan which actually subsequently showed liver metastasis. Uh, he was initially treated with all the chemotherapy that I could give, four different types of chemotherapy regimes and he Stop, wanted to stop all the chemotherapy because he felt that his health condition was deteriorating. And he opted for some, at that point in time, in 2015, something new called immunotherapy. And he was given this drug called pembrolizumab. As you can see, this is the PET scan. Uh, my arrow, this is the liver. All the black dots that you see there are the cancer in the liver. And this, this was August 2015. By the time in December, uh, sorry, November 2015, all the black dots have disappeared. And this is another view of the scan. Uh, you can see in August, you see all these dots here. It's due to the cancer, but in December, all gone. And he's been well since, and I just saw him last week, he's well. So this uh, is just to tell us that uh, with all these advances, the main advances are advances in imaging, like use of PET scan. We have advances in surgery as well as diagnostic procedures. Advances in the molecular biology to help us subtract the various types of gastrointestinal cancers, which also helps us in the management. And of course, as I mentioned earlier in this case, advances is in immuno-oncology, which help us treat patients with immunotherapy and extending their survival. Thank you for that, Dr. Fu. I think it's so wonderful that we have all these advancements that are helping even more patients nowadays. How about you, Dr. Chua? Could you please expound on some of these uh, more advanced diagnostic and interventional procedures? And uh, yeah, how do these differ from one another? Okay, um, I'm just gonna talk about that. There are many, many advances in endoscopy. And so I'm just gonna talk about a few. Uh, in terms of what it, they do. Um, so it, I think I, perhaps my first slide, okay, um, on endoscopic ultrasound. Now endoscopic ultrasound um, has been around for a while for us to look mainly at the pancreas and it's basically a, a, a normal endoscope, endoscope with an ultrasound probe at the end of it. But at the beginning of the, the 2000 era, uh, the, the scope was designed such that a needle could actually come out of the scope. So, so this greatly advanced the ability to take biopsies from organs uh, behind and outside the stomach. So the pancreas was a very difficult place to obtain a biopsy. Uh, but for me now, I, I would go down with a scope. Uh, the ultrasound would show me the pancreas. Uh, through the wall of the of the stomach, and then using a needle, I can guide a needle into the, the suspected uh, cancer and take some cells out, and they can examine this under the microscope. And nowadays, the needles are even better. We can get better tissue, 
and, and that helps with uh, uh, all the various uh, genetic testings and, and molecular testing and, and that helps with Dr. Fu in his, in his uh, use of various uh, treatments. Um, so let's go on to the next one. So that's for diagnosis. This is sub endoscopic submucosal dissection. So this is a stomach cancer of a patient of mine. Uh, this is an early stomach cancer. This is uh, early stage one, and therefore it only affects the surface of the stomach and hasn't actually penetrated through the walls of the stomach. And hence I can remove this uh, cancer uh, using endoscopy and so preserve the stomach and we, we actually haven't taken out the stomach, we've just removed the cancer. So, so that helps the patient because it's a very minimally invasive technique and, and preserves the stomach. And as far as the patient is concerned, his lifestyle, uh, you know, in terms of eating and, and stuff continues to be the same. Uh, go on to the next one. Now, this is where we do uh, endoscopy for palliation. So when uh, a cancer uh, cannot be removed, uh, so in this case, a pancreas cancer, and it grows very big and it causes a, an obstruction of the bowel duct. Um, we are now able, instead of having to put a tube that comes out of the skin, uh, we are now able to connect the, the bowel duct above the obstruction to the duodenum or the stomach. And this allows us, and put a stent across, and this allows the draining of the bowel duct, uh, relieving a patient's jaundice. Meantime, he is going to get his chemo, uh, hopefully to shrink the tumor. So this allows for a better quality of life. So the advances in endoscopy can be seen both in diagnosis, in treatment, as well as in palliation and to improve quality of life. Thank you for that, Dr. Chua. Perhaps Dr. Liao would like to take this next question. It's about surgery. So we've talked about uh, diagnostic procedures. Let's now talk about surgical procedures. Dr. Liao, what are some of the most recent advancements in terms of digestive cancer surgery? And uh, what are the adva uh, advantages of these advancements? Do they translate to more efficiency, better safety for the patients, and so on? So cancer surgery is a continuously evolving field. Um, one of the most uh, important measure is the operation mortality. As you can see, the primary uh, workhorse operation for pancreatic cancer is a Whipple operation because majority of this cancer of the pancreas happen at the head of pancreas and to remove the entire tumor from the head of pancreas, you need this operation procedure called Whipple operation. And the Whipple operation is one of the most major operation in the tummy, in the abdomen. In 1970s, to do this operation, a uh, patient is expected to face a risk of operation mortality of near 20 to 25 percent. Now, uh, at the turn of the millennium, with the advances in uh, surgical technology, such as better imaging, as you have heard from Dr. Fu and Dr. Chua, that with better diagnostic uh, technology and imaging tools, we are able to see the tumor better, we are able to locate the tumor better, and uh, therefore, the surgery is more precise. Um, not only we can see better uh, in terms of the tools that are available in the operation to dissect the tumor, to control the bleeding, and to uh, make sure that the tumor is adequately uh, removed. Um, these have all contributed to better and safer operation with lower operation mortality and longer long-term survival of the patient. So in terms of surgical technologies, uh, technologies such as nanotechnology, medical optics, miniaturizations of the instruments, they have all contributed to the uh, you know, advances in uh, surgery. And 
uh, the surgery has also moved from open surgery to keyhole operation, what we call laparoscopic surgery. And now uh, the latest advances is in robotic surgery to perform this uh, major operation uh, called WIPO operation. Oh, thank you for that, Dr. Chua. Just a follow up. How do doctors decide which type of surgery to conduct on which patient? What factors go into the determination of that decision? Well, uh, the most important decision to make is whether the, uh, the patient is fit for the operation. So if the patient is physically fit for the operation, the next consideration is whether this cancer is amenable for cure with surgery. So if the, uh, cancer, if the patient has cancer that is amenable for cure by surgery, the, determinant, uh, the determining factors are the size of the tumor, how big it is, uh, whether they are uh, located near important structure that need to preserve. Um, so if it is in the head of a pancreas, away from the important blood vessels, uh, let me show you the model. So you see, the, this is a pancreas, the gallbladder, the duodenum, and the head of a pancreas. Mm -hmm. And when the tumor at the head of a pancreas is very near to these two important blue and red blood vessels, it will make the operation a little bit more challenging. It still can be done, but uh, the surgery will be uh, longer and it will take more time for us to remove not only the tumor, but part of the vessels and reconstruct it. And we will take some more time to reconstruct it back. Yeah. So uh, these are some of the consideration that we need to uh, uh, to know, well, some of the factors that we need to know in order to make uh, precise consideration for the type of surgery that the patient required. Okay. And um, you mentioned nanotechnology and miniature instruments and robotics. How long has Mount Elizabeth Hospitals been using these advanced surgical techniques? And maybe like Dr. Fu, you can also share like one success story of a patient of yours who has benefited from these surgeries. As uh, you have heard from Dr. Chua, a lot of this instrument that Dr. Chua uh, currently is performing is due to the advances in this technology. Uh, the uh, instrument is getting smaller, the scope is getting smaller, and then the uh, medical optics has improved not only in endoscopy, but also in endoscopic imaging like ultrasonography. Um, the instruments that we are using uh, in the past, we uh, they are heavy and cumbersome, but now some of these instruments are made of titanium. They are light and precise. The surgeon can manipulate it better. Uh, and also with miniaturization of mm -hmm. uh, instrumentation and the nanotechnology, a lot of this keyhole operation that are used to operate on other organ is now made possible for uh, leprechaun laparoscopic surgery for the pancreatic uh, uh, operation. Right. Thank you for that, Dr. Liao. Uh, going back to Dr. Chua, circling back to diagnostic procedures, how do doctors also determine which diagnostic procedure to conduct on which patient? Because I imagine, like, un unlike surgeries, diagnostic right. procedures don't have that much of a risk, I mean. Um, well, uh, everything has risks. Uh, I would say that diagnostic procedures have fewer risks and lower risks than, than uh, therapeutic procedures in general. Um, however, uh, when you ask me how I select a, a modality of, of investigation, it will depend on how the patient presents. So if the patient uh, comes in complaining of uh, abdominal pain in the upper abdomen, and uh, I, I would su probably suspect uh, a clinical suspicion of something in that region. We, we might go for a gastroscope, we might go for a, a CT scan first. So we use mo various modalities, uh, preferably uh, non-invasive first, so a scan of some form and some blood test to help guide us to where the probable problem is. 
And then once we've used either one of the endoscopic techniques or the CT scan says there is a mass in the pancreas, uh, then it becomes obvious that I would need to use an endoscopic ultrasound technique to go and evaluate the, the lesion in the pancreas. If it was a, a, a endo endoscope and I was looking and I found a, a, a cancer, an early cancer, and I chose to, to use an endoscopic ultrasound to see how deep the cancer has penetrated, I could also do so. So choosing the, the modality of investigation uh, really depends on how the patient presents and subsequent scans and, and uh, blood tests. And that can guide me to which uh, endoscopic uh, diagnostic modality is best for the patient. Um, after we have done that and made the diagnosis, uh, then the next step would be determining how the therapy should occur. So if it is a very early cancer then, and, and I'm able to remove it endoscopically, I would offer that to the patient. Uh, I would also offer the patient the option to discuss their case with a surgeon to, to, to let them weigh up the options and, and then decide which one they, they would choose. Okay. Thank you for that, Dr. Chua. Just uh, one more follow-up question. How equipped is Mount Elizabeth Hospitals when it comes to the delivery of these diagnoses? What uh, advantages does the hospital have in terms of these advanced procedures? So, so Mount Elizabeth has some of the most advanced uh, uh, technologies in, in terms of endoscopy. So in 2004, it, it, uh, in 2006, it started introducing endoscopic ultrasound. We bought the first machine in, in private practice in the private hospitals in Singapore. And that was quite an advanced machine. And uh, not so long ago, a couple of years ago, we upgraded it to a newer version of the endoscopic mm -hmm. ultrasound machine. The Mount Elizabeth Novena has the same equivalent machine uh, on their side for doing endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, as far as the other, uh, the normal endoscopes are concerned, uh, the high resolution, uh, both Mount Elizabeth uh, uh, hospitals have uh, the latest systems uh, and, and they are all very, very good. Um, so yes, uh, they, they are very good at, at uh, producing uh, the environment to carry out these uh, procedures and I've been doing them since 2006, so it's very, very good. Thank you for that, Dr. Chua. Uh, can I, I understand? I, yes. Uh, uh, make a comment. Uh, yes, please. The other advantage in Singapore, not only in Mount Elizabeth Hospital, is not only we have the latest uh, machine, but we also have the support because the technology, we need uh, some of the technical support team to help us not only to maintain and also to guide the doctors because very often this new technology that comes in, they have a new application, they have new function that uh, the doctor also need to be trained. So uh, one of the advantages in Singapore is a lot of this company had, have their headquarters and training center here. So the support mm -hmm. team, the training teams uh, come along with the technology. So this is a package that is important uh, in terms of uh, supporting the hospital and providing the safest new technology services to the patient. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Liao. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Uh, I understand that Parkway Cancer Center also specializes in liver cancer treatment and management. Dr. Fu, I'd like to ask if you could please share some of the latest advancements when it comes to liver cancer management and treatment, especially uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, which I believe is the most common type of liver cancer. Okay, so uh, in the first place, I must mention that uh, in any treatment is a multidisciplinary approach. So we do need to work in collaboration with people like Dr. Chua and Dr. Liao, the surgeons, because the early stages of liver cancer, usually they need to go for surgery. And that's the mainstay of treatment. And those who have early stage but very bad liver function, we also need people like Dr. Chua to help us to assess whether they are fit for transplant, which is another option for treatment. 
And all those who are more advanced, they will end up seeing me. Uh, I will carry on with sharing my, my slides first about the advances. Uh, can you all see? Let me just share. So um, as I mentioned, it's a multidisciplinary approach. And the earlier stage, they need surgery. And the more advanced stage, they may need actually liver transplant. So, but the in-between more advanced stages, for the longest time, actually the treatment has been chemotherapy. And up to about 10 to 15 years ago, uh, with the advances in molecular biology, we had molecularly targeted therapy. In the last few years, uh, immunotherapy has been the mainstay of treatment. I'll quickly explain about the molecular uh, therapy. So for a cancer to grow from a small tumor to a much larger tumor, what it does is it secretes a lot of chemicals to the nearby blood vessels and telling the blood vessels to feed it with more nutrition. So, and they secrete all these chemicals. So finding out about this, we have uh, inhibitors to inhibit this process. And so one of the drugs is called sorafenib, which I've been using for the last maybe 13 to 14 years. So I just give an example of uh, this patient of mine who is a businessman from India, had liver cancer in 2010, had removed the right lobe, and then subsequently the tumor marker was high and he was found to have uh, spread to the lymph nodes in the cancer. And we started him on this drug called sorafenib and uh, his tumor marker actually remained normal as of 2012. So this is the liver resection. And this was when he was found to have a spread to the liver. And after treatment with the uh, sorafenib, it all disappeared. In fact, he had a new cancer, a second cancer, and he sub subsequently died from the second cancer. But he actually remained well with this drug called sorafenib. What about immunotherapy? So another story, lady from uh, Vietnam, uh, hepatitis B carrier, found to have liver cancer in 2015 had uh, trans-arterial chemoembolization, but has spread in 2015. And he did, she didn't respond to serafinib. Mm -hmm. And so she was started on immunotherapy. And since then, she's been well. So this is the spread to the lung. And that was in September. In November, it has disappeared. And she's well up to today. So uh, I will stop sharing my screen now. And uh, uh, that's the main thing that we have recently. That's amazing. Sounds, sounds amazing. Thank you, Dr. Fu. At this juncture, we've already discussed a lot of topics, but I'm positive that our audience prepared even more questions for our experts. So why don't we take a few questions from the audience? Okay. So one question here for Dr. Viao. Dr. Liao, what are the differences between pancreatic cancer and periampullary cancer? How do you prevent these cancers and what are their treatment options? Uh, right, so we differentiate uh, pancreatic cancer from what you call periampullary cancer because these two are completely a different um, cancer altogether, different in the sense that uh, in terms of its aggressiveness, in terms of the way they behave biologically, they are completely different. Now, for the purists, purists like me, I will further differentiate the periampillary cancer from ampillary cancers. Um, I will explain to you shortly uh, the difference between the pancreatic and the periampillary. First, let me uh, tell you the difference between ampillary uh, cancer and the periampillary cancers. So the ampular in Latin means uh, amphora or a flush. The uh, the, the uh, Roman flush is called amphora. So ampular come from that uh, Latin word. As you can see in the uh, in this model, uh, the pancreatic duct, the duct that bring the digestive juice to the duodenum, join at the junction. Uh, with the bowel duct. So before they open into the duodenum, there is this uh, swelling uh, uh, sac 
look like the flush, what we call ampullar. So any tumor developed that originate from this area is called ampullary tumor. Whereas when we talk about periampillary tumor, is a cancer that arises around the neighborhood of this ampulla, of this region. Usually we talk about within the two centimeter uh, neighborhood from the ampulla. Now, the, um, the periampillary cancer is a mixed type of tumor. It makes a made up of four different type of tumor. Uh, it all depends on where is the origin of the mother. If the mother comes from the duodenum, it's called duodenal tumor near the ampulla. That is also called periampillary tumor. And the, if the tumor comes from the pancreatic duct uh, near the ampulla, it's also called periampillary tumor. But those that come from the lower part of the bowel duct is also periampillary tumor. Uh, tumor. So as you can see, it's a mixed bag of tumor that it make it very confusing. Uh, so in the past, we lumped them together because the number of this type of cancer are very small. We grouped them together for the purpose of uh, uh, beefing up the statistic in, uh, in our clinical studies. Now, the main difference between the ampullary tumor and the pancreatic the run of the new pancreatic tumor that come from the head of pancreas is that pancreatic cancer generally is very aggressive. Um, they have very poor survival outcome even after surgery. As you can imagine, uh, for pancreatic cancer, sometimes after successful uh, operation with the Whipple operation, the survive the survival rate in terms of five years survival is in the region of twenty. 20 to 25 percent. Whereas for ampullary cancers, the five-year survival can be as high as 45 to 50 percent. So when you talk about periampillary cancer, it all depends on whether we are talking about duodenal cancers, distal bowel duct cancers, or pancreatic cancers. The best, uh, the best of course, is the ampullary cancer that has the best prognosis, followed by the duodenal cancers. So any cancer that come from the lower part of the bowel duct near the ampulla or in the pancreas, usually their survival and the outcome is not as good. And in terms of chemotherapy after uh, the operation, is again different. Uh, uh, Dr. Fu will elaborate on this here. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Liao. Mm. Let's take another question for Dr. Fu. The question is, amid this pandemic, what are the precautions that what are precautions for cancer patients and if there is a need to strictly follow the treatment program? And another question related to cancer patients, is it advisable for cancer patients to be vaccinated? I'm thinking this is in relation to COVID-19 vaccines. Okay, so to answer the first question, uh, what precautions do we advise our patients with cancer? Uh, normally, we will advise them to put on the mask uh, put on the mask as well as wash their hands frequently or use a sanitizer, hand sanitizer uh, frequently. Sorry. Yes. Hello? Hello? Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry, now my, I'll carry on. Uh, <laughs> so it's very important that, you know, they don't go to crowded places and then also to stay at home if possible. Uh, yes, they should try to follow the treatment regime, and most of us doctors will try not to try to limit the amount of time they need to come to hospital, so that they do, do they do not mix with other people or get uh, exposed to people on the way to the hospital. So most of the time, you try to explore whether there are any uh, tablets which they can take at home instead of coming to hospital. But of course, if they have to come for like, for example, if they have lymphoma, they need to be in hospital for intravenous treatment, no choice. They still have to follow the treatment regime uh, strictly. Whether is it advisable for cancer patients to be vaccinated? Those who are on active treatment, we do not advise because the studies for, for the vaccines do not include cancer patients who are on active treatment. So we do not know the, whether there's any benefit to the vaccination for this group of patients. However, cancer patients who had completed their treatment 
and they are not on any chemotherapy, they should actually be vaccinated. It's strongly recommended that they should be vaccinated. All right, thank you for that, Dr. Fu. Another question also for Dr. Fu. Uh, Dr. Fu, what are the causes of colon cancer? And what are the treatment options for pre-cancer, early stage, and late stage colon cancer, which has already, let's say, spread to the liver, for example? Okay, so uh, in general, uh, cancer, we usually there's uh, environmental as well as genetic causes. So in colon cancer, there are some genetic causes, which is people with family history, or those with certain abnormal genes that are passed from parent to child. Then, of course, there are environmental factors, but a lot of it we do not know. All right, so I will just share my screen again, uh, just a quick, uh, because to help you all to understand. Okay, so from a normal colon to a cancer, there are a lot of genetic changes, all right? So from a normal colon, they end up with what we call a polyp, and from a polyp, they become cancer in colon. So it takes many years for the polyp to become a cancer. So, uh, and then usually the cancer will start growing in the wall of the intestine before they start spreading to the rest of the body, like to the lung or to the liver. Okay, so, uh, To stop sure. Okay, sorry. So to answer the question, uh, they for the early stage, like when they have a polyp, so that's where we talk about screening, where people uh, need to go, especially the age of 50, they need to go for screening to remove any polyps because over a matter of years, they, the polyps can become cancerous. So this is for early stage. They are also to prevent uh, the formation of uh, colon cancer. However, for stage one to stage three, the most important treatment is surgery. They need to have surgery. However, if they're spread, for example, to the liver or to the lungs or to other parts of the body, then the mainstay of treatment is chemotherapy to control the disease. In a small group of people with stage four cancer, if the cancer has spread to a limited area in the body, like in the lung or limited part of the liver, uh, we usually try to incorporate surgery with chemotherapy to help uh, to cure these patients. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Fu. I have one question for Dr. Chua. Uh, this is about the tumor markers. Is the CA19-9 tumor marker accurate as a as some form of inflammations may also cause the elevation of the CA19-9? And what are the possible causes of this elevation and how can we control it? Okay, um, CA19-9 is, is frequently used as a marker for pancreas cancer, although uh, it really shouldn't be used for screening. Um, the, the accuracy is more for patients who already have a diagnosed uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, so CA99 can go up in a whole host of cancers, in stomach cancer, colon cancer, bowel duct cancers, gallbladder cancers. And, and so it's not just cancer, it can also go up in benign conditions. So for example, if there is an obstruction of the bowel duct, this is called obstructive jaundice, the CA99 will go and potentially can go very high. Uh, you have chronic liver disease, uh, liver failures, uh, pancreatic inflammation, acute pancreatitis goes up, chronic pancreatitis goes up, even goes up in diabetes. In some cases, low, low level of going up. Um, it goes up in genetic diseases such as cystic fibrosis. So really, the CA99 um, is not very accurate for purposes of population screening. Okay. However, if a patient comes to us with a, with a mass in the CT scan and, and we do the CA99, it supports the diagnosis of a tumor. In terms of food, 
Um, well, some of the rare, rare things that has caused the CA-19 lines to rise in the literature uh, would be something like drinking lots of black tea. Okay, so there have been cases where a patient may drink one and a half to two liters of black tea in a day. And, and over time, their CA-99 has been found to be high. I guess they drink so much tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Thank you, Dr. Chua. Another question for Dr. Liao. What is the current treatment for hilar cholangiocarcinoma? Right. Uh, let me explain what is hilar cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, cholangiocarcinoma means cancer of the bowel duct. Um, if you look at this model, uh, the bowel duct is the green structure here that uh, extends from inside the liver, like a Christmas tree, go down to the stem, uh, which is the common bowel duct. So mm. the part between the liver and the common bowel duct, which is at the uh, base of the liver, that is called the hyler. The hyler is the uh, exit of the bowel duct joining into the common bowel duct. So as you can imagine, that is a highly critical point uh, for tumor to form because any tumor uh, at that point can block the flow of the bowel in the bowel duct. Of course, the best uh, treatment for hyalur cholangial carcinoma is surgery. But because of its location, sometimes surgery uh, can be very challenging uh, because if the tumor has extended into the liver, part of the liver and the entire common bowel duct has to be removed together with the lymph nodes around the region. So the lymph nodes around this part of the bowel duct has to remove uh, along with the gallbladder and part of the liver. So very often, if the tumor is so advanced, removing the tumor in, in its entirety is not possible, then we will have considered our other treatment that either slow down the growth of the tumor and to uh, treat the blockage of the bowel duct caused by the tumor. That is when uh, Dr. Chua will have to come in and uh, uh, Dr. Fu will have to come in and consider uh, what are some of the chemotherapy or mm -hmm. a molecular therapy uh, that need to be recommended for the patient. Okay. Thank you for that, Dr. Liu. Yeah. For Dr. Fu, mm -hmm. another question. May I ask if you use genetic testing or foundation medicine as a guide in your cancer treatment? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, especially for cancers in the stomach, the pancreas, the liver, bowel ducts, as well as in colon cancer. So in colon cancer, we do it routinely because a lot of these genetic markers will determine the course of treatment. Uh, this is also done for stomach cancers. Uh, whereas for the cholangial, which Dr. Liao was trying to explain, we also do send for foundation medicine because a lot of times there are some new genetic uh, markers that we have medicine for currently. And those are, although very rare, but we can still uh, give an opportunity to help control these cancers for a longer time. All right. Thank you for that, Dr. Pu. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay, uh, for Dr. Yao again. Neuroendocrine, which are which are these tumors specifically? Is this Argentinoma, Pheochromocytoma, insuli Insulinoma, or something else? Yeah, if you look at the development of medicine and the way we label the cancer, um, it has progressed. In the past, when we do not know what uh, it is, we just describe the way uh, the cancer appear. So uh, in about 100 years ago, um, when we look at the neuroendocrine tumor, uh, they look like cancer, but they don't behave like the real cancer. That's why we call them carcinoid. So the leg, the legacy term for neuroendocrine tumor in the past is called carcinoid because carcinoid means it looked like carcinoma. So the term carcinoid means uh, cancer looking. They look like cancer, but they do not behave 
so aggressively by like cancers. Okay. So over the years, uh, because of the progress in medicine, we are able to look at the cell under the microscope using different stain. So we stained it with some chemical to bring out the features of a cancer. So Argentine actually comes, Argentinoma comes from the word Argentine, which means silver, like Argentina, where a lot of silver is found there. So Argentinoma means the tumor take up a lot of silver stain. A uh, few chromocytoma is the cells that take up a lot of dye, chromo means the color, the different mm -hmm. type of colors. So now with the current advances, uh, we are able to trace a cancer to the mother cells. To the, so if we are able to trace to the mother cells, then of course, if you know who is your mother, you know your uh, lineage, you are able to uh, study the biological behavior better uh, when we mm -hmm. classify them. So mm -hmm. in Sulipnoma, because we are able to uh, identify the cancer cells well, to the mother cells that produce insulin, which is the, uh, the alpha beta cells uh, in, our neuro, in our neuroendocrine organ in the pancreas. So if you look at all this term like epidoma, pheochromocytoma, uh, they are all a part of puzzles of a neuroendocrine tumor, but the terms has evolved. A lot of this term, some of them are uh, legacy terms that we use uh, because uh, it is uh, discovered by the founder. But for the purists like us, we prefer to use the scientific term that is most recent for effective uh, professional communication with our colleague and scientists. So uh, insulinoma is a current term, Agentinoma is the old term. Fuel chromocytoma is also the, the term that we currently use is a, a tumor that arises from the adrenal gland, which is a gland that sits on top of the kidney. Yeah. So they are all neuroendocrine tumor. It's just come from different mother cells. All right. Thank you for that clarification, Dr. Liao. For all those unanswered questions, uh, Mount Elizabeth Hospitals and Parkway Cancer Center will reach out and connect you to our experts after this webinar. Thank you. Okay, so one final question for everyone in this panel before we wrap up today's session. What is your key takeaway from this discussion? Uh, among all the things discussed in today's webinar, what is the one thing you would like our viewers to remember? Maybe we can start with Dr. Liao and then Dr. Chua and then Dr. Fu. I think one of the key takeaway is uh, we are living, living in a world where food security and food uh, safety is a problem. Even though you eat healthily, uh, uh, practice healthy lifestyle, sometimes we are still faced with uh, uh, pollution from the air and uh, contamination of the food. If you look at Dr. Fu uh, show earlier on on the slides of the top 10 cancer, the majority of this cancer come from the digestive system and also from the respiratory system. And that really impresses on us that we are living in an environment that are polluted and the food that we take may not be 100% secure and safe. So the, the, the best thing to do is we need to mitigate some of this risk um, and at the same time, uh, take steps to have your health green check to diagnose cancer early. With an early diagnosis, you can have better option and more option for treatment and a more successful long-term outcome of the therapy. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Yao, Dr. Chua. Well, I, I'm going to echo what Dr. Liao has said. Uh, basically, I, I think it's important for all of us to remember the old adage that we uh, keep ourselves healthy um, and to reduce the, the chance of getting any any long-term diseases, especially cancer. So, so exercise uh, is in moderation. That's important. Uh, regular exercise, not to gain too much weight, uh, avoid smoking and avoid al too much alcohol and eat your vegetables, okay? So these are very, very straightforward advice that people give you. And I think generally, as you reach a certain age, uh, you, you would want to go for regular uh, medical checkups, uh, screening, 
and mm. and it's important to try and detect cancer early because the earlier you detect the cancer uh, the more treatment options you have uh, mm. the more success at treatment and some of these treatments can be uh, very minimally invasive and 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 you can 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 get out of the situation much much better so in this uh, current times all that remains for me to say is to stay safe and, and to take care thank you dr chua dr fu actually i'm actually about to echo what the other two doctors have said uh Cancer treatment is very expensive, especially immunotherapy. So what we want you all to do is to prevent. And most important is your lifestyle. We want you to eat healthily, more vegetables, and exercise regularly. Stop smoking and then drink in moderation. And most important, at the age of about 50, you should go for screening, especially for colonoscopy, because it's a, the third most common cancer in Philippines. So it's good to go for screening. See your doctor for screening. That's all I have to say. Stay safe. Right. Thank you, Dr. Fu. With that, I'd like to thank all our panelists for joining us today. What a very fruitful way to end today's agenda. Many thanks to our speakers, Dr. Fu Kian Fong, Dr. Chua Chu Shang, and Dr. Liao Quin Him. Thank you also to our partners, Parkway Cancer Center, Singapore, Mount Elizabeth Hospital, Singapore, Can Hope Manila, Bank Marketing Association of the Philippines, British Chamber of Commerce, Philippines, Management Association of the Philippines, Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, The Freeman, and The Philippine Star. And of course, to all of you, our viewers, for joining us in today's discussion. Please follow the Facebook pages of Mount Elizabeth Hospital Singapore and Can Hope Manila for more information about the fight against cancer. Please also contact the Manila office of Parkway Hospital Singapore for more inquiries. They're located at the ground floor of Marco Polo Hotel, Meralco Avenue and Sapphire Street, Ortiga Center, Pasig City. Their email address is manila.ph at parkwaypantai.com. Their mobile phone is 0917-526-7576. Tune in to Business World's social media pages and be updated on our next projects. Again, this is Patricia Mirasol. This has been Business World Insights. Stay safe, stay healthy, and good afternoon. <laughs>